fathers should never downplay their importance. I think I've really spoken about how important mothers are. That's absolutely true. Mothers are so important. I'm never going to even attempt to downplay any of that. Fathers certainly themselves need to acknowledge that and own how important they are. Not just the responsibility side, but there's a positive part to that too. You can have a great impact on your children's lives if you're aware of it, aware of how important your role is. We are here with Daniel Stephen from DanielEducatorAndParent.com. And Daniel says that children literally are the future. They are what our focus should be about, and they're the people that we should help. And there's a lot to navigate. We always worry if we're parenting too little, not enough, or there are things we don't even know we should be focusing on, and so much more. So, Daniel, glad to be speaking with you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Glad to have you. And and so you're an educator, a teacher, and a parent, but what has you excited to get out of bed in the morning these days? What is your passion? Oh, what gets me out of bed really is um, trying my very best to help parents have the best parenting like they can. There's so many parents I speak to. The number one thing that's often dragging them down is they feel unsure about what they're doing. So when I see a parent have that light bulb moment, it's, it's a great feeling to see them be able to continue their parenting journey from that point with a bit more confidence. Wonderful. And you you told me a few weeks ago that if you are concerned about your parenting, then you're already ahead of a lot of parents, right? You're already on the right track. If you have these concerns, it means that you're paying attention and that you're alert and chances are you should probably give yourself a little bit of a break because you're probably doing better than you think. But what should parents really be thinking about and focusing on? Like where where are parents sometimes missing the ball or where should just there be that extra attention focused? I would say the extra attention can definitely be focused in terms of Thinking about your child's intent when they're interacting with you. And very often I'll see a parent speaking with their child and they almost straight away make the assumption that their child's trying to do something wrong and that they're in some way with the way they're speaking to the child, assigning blame. And the child gets doing their own thing. A child doesn't think like we do. So a child's not trying And of course, when they're very young, I'm not speaking about teenagers, but when they're very young, they're not trying to pull one over your eyes and so forth. You know, they just want to connect with you. And I've seen many occasions where a parent has assumed that the child is intending something bad when that's not the case. And the child reacts to a parent making that assumption. And the whole thing kind of blows over and blows out of proportion from there. So I guess one example I can think of is, let's say a parent is talking to another parent, their child runs up to them, mommy, daddy, runs into them, and their children go, hands forward, pushes their parents in the stomach, and the parent says, oh, God, why did you hurt me? Now, of course, if they say to say to your child, you know, please don't push me, that doesn't feel good, but the way you speak to a child can make them feel like you believe they intended to hurt you. That wasn't their goal. Like you can say to your child, look, I know you want to get my attention, but that actually you're you're pretty strong. Be careful next time. Yeah. You can speak to your child in a way, correcting them without assigning ill intent. I like that. Why are you trying to hurt me? And the child goes, well, wasn't trying to hurt you. And I've seen the child blow over. They don't throw ill intent in there and it might not have been the case. And then with that misunderstanding, one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, and then you have a whole situation. And that, that's an interesting reframe because uh, me and my wife, I, I doubt that we're alone in that in parenting, we, we got a few little injuries, right? You get the uh, the head gets thrown back and it hurts your teeth or you get scratched in the lip. We've had our little nicks and bruises. And I have to remind myself, and I, I you're making me realize, I told my wife sometimes, if we have like an accident or, or some kind of thing like that happens, then we have to tell ourselves, well, he, he didn't mean to. He he wasn't out to 
cause harm or to cause this problem. He was just being a kid. He was just get we say getting into trouble or getting into things. He was just investigating and being chaotic and being exactly. random. And it's it, yeah, it's very easy to apply adult rules to a child just because and but they're just being kids they're just, they're just seeing what they whatever there is to be doing so that's interesting for their own thing yeah and if the children are very much in the now they don't understand the idea of consequences and so on and all that the same age particularly say two to three yeah it was called the egocentric stage meaning they're literally the center of their own world and the I they're just now starting to figure out they can affect the world around them. So the very idea of someone else's feelings and that their actions can affect another person is only a concept that's starting to emerge. So when you act, when you put your intent in a child's action, the child is very generally responding in a big way because the child internally knows. No, I mean, I'm trying to hurt my mom. I haven't even thought about my mom when I was playing with that toy. That is not their thought process. Like you said, it's easy to put an adult logic or framework on a child when that's just not how they think. A child's playing because they're exploring what they're able to do, seeing how that toy, whatever it is, they're manipulating reacts to what they're doing. They're not thinking, oh, if I twist this, it'll break. They're thinking, oh, I'm watching these little gears or whatever it is, turn it, and if it happens to break, you often see it's not a shock to us it broke, but to a child, my toy broke. They're very surprised, even though adult mindset, you'd think you know, I've, I've, had, I've had so many of these moments where internally I'm thinking, of course that toy broke, you're twisting it that way. But to a child, that's, that wasn't their goal, the majority of the time. So... If I said to them, why did you want to break that toy? The child would very rightfully so say, I didn't want to break it yeah. and have a moment. But if I say to the child, oh, did you see what happened? Yeah, it broke. Yeah, next time you hold the toy, watch how it moves and be careful because you can break it if you're not careful. Oh, and that often gets the child thinking about it. And because I didn't define blame and ill intent, the child was more receptive to what I had to say. I love it. You are, are learning along with them. They're learning the world, but you're also yeah. learning how to communicate in their way. Yes. So they're figuring out they have an impact on the world around them. But also, while doing that, they're figuring out their own emotions that have inside them. And they don't really know how to express them yet. So they learn how to express it based on us. So if I see a broken toy and I don't have a big reaction. Oh my goodness, the toy's broken. What are we going to do? My child's going to follow suit. He's going to join me at my level. But if I very calmly say, yeah, it broke. I know you didn't mean to, but got to be careful next time, but this one's got to go in the bin. Next one, do it like this instead. And because I didn't accuse her of purposely breaking that toy, he heard me when I explained how to play with the next one. I love it. Being being calmer and and just more gentle about it. And uh, and you're making me think uh, our kid is three and he probably has a, a, a toddler mail time maybe four times a day these days, but I, I couldn't even tell you how many times because I feel like I've gotten such a thick skin of like when that happens, when there's the, the, the crying of just kind of, you know, I kind of smile and, and laugh about it and wait the minute or so for it to be over. So it's like, uh, like we've been saying, I'm kind of trained along with my kid as far as dealing with them better. And so when you think about previous generations, right? Previous generations, they, 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 they spanked, they smoked indoors. And so you, you would hope that every generation gets better. And especially in this day and age, we're all like learning how to be better parents, right? And you, you figure that maybe in the decades or, or centuries or thousands of years past, maybe the, the focus was just on surviving, right? On just on, on the farming. Yeah. But now we have this extra time to be better parents. But at the same time, I'm sometimes concerned about my child's 
maybe in the future not being independent enough. And I'm I'm always worried about like, okay, am I being am I being helpful enough and hands on enough, but also yeah. kind of dialing it back when needed, so that way they can be strong when the time comes. So, do you ever think about this, or do you ever deal with parents who kind of think about this of just like, how do I how do I know how far to push and how can I give my child the best life, but also allow them to have the strength they need when they're older. Yeah, that is definitely the balancing act, and you are definitely not alone. I think every single parent has that thought, oh, I want to protect my child, but I want them to be able to make their own choices. I want them to feel small, but I don't want them to get hurt. And it's always those dual natures that we're balancing. Gordon Peterson once said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it said along the lines of allow your child to explore dangerous things carefully. He went carefully. So for example, I've seen children at the playground, and the playground is made to be climbed. We're talking to climb on it. And it's right, and okay, it's got a little bit of a height, but if the child is watching where the hands are going and holding the rope correctly, they can do it safely. There's potential for harm, but they can do it safely. Now, an overshielding parent would not allow the child to climb that playground or to maybe climb one rung and no further. And not caring parent would not even be watching. But I think that the best balance would be allow them to climb, they be with their own reach. If they have a little slip, catch them, let them know, oh, your foot wasn't here. And I think that's the best way to do it in terms of the physical play anyway. Very often, my daughter, when she was younger, was a little nervous to that height. I'm not terrified. But because I was literally right behind her, she stretched the, not only her literal muscles, but her, her bravery muscles, trying something that initially she was apprehensive about. And if I didn't encourage her to do it, she probably wouldn't climb it. Because let's face it, we, don't, we tend to avoid things that we don't like. But we as adults sometimes know we have to do things we don't like to function in life. Children don't have that understanding yet. If they don't like it, they just really don't want to do it. And it takes some convincing to let them know, even if you don't like it, you've got to do it as well. So I guess back to your question of that balancing act. Yes, it is tricky, but as long as you're allowing them to explore whether it's something dangerous or not, as long as they're doing it carefully and you're there with them, that's okay. If, for example, I had a fireplace and my daughter loved looking at the fire and, of course, I would never, ever let her touch the fire, but what I said to her one day was, look, hold your hand close, not too close, but hold it a bit. What does it feel like? Oh, it's really hot. And so I said to her, how many does it get hotter when you get closer? Yeah. So would it feel nice if she kept that? No, I think it would hurt. But by allowing her to feel a little bit of it, she understood. She, it actually, she got to internalize what she was learning and really learn it. But if I just said to her, stay away from that, no explanation, not allow her to experience a little bit of it, you can even have a clear why. And if in my absence, she'd probably go for it when I'm not there to explain it. That's the other thing as well. When children are overly shielded, the second the supervisor is out of the picture, they'll give it a go. But the problem being, they're giving it a go in your absence, slash, without the structured teaching you can give as a parent. Okay. So you, you have your kind of your, your range of like, at what, at what, low level of attention am I am I a non-existent parent and a what too much of attention am I the the overbearing parent and somewhere in between there is that level where your child is taking the risk and I'm enjoying kind of experiencing your teaching style a little bit because it's it seems like the the kind of the the multi-step process here is you say, well, here's what I want to teach, right? I want to teach that fire is hot. But if he just said fire is hot, well that's not really fun. And does that really stick? Well, not really. But then if you kind of 
ask some interesting questions and have them draw their own conclusions and have them answer, then it's like the, the answer came from them instead of just being supplied by you. So that way it really sticks. And then it kind of gives them those tools to continue that behavior in the future of not just waiting for someone to give them the answer or not just blindly obeying the authority, but drawing their own conclusions. Mm. And if there's a problem to be solved, solving it in three to five little questions and answers and then coming up with the conclusion that way. And so that that's wonderful. Yeah. And so you're a, a co-author with Pat mm. Masidi in this book, From Potential to Prosperity, and you share some of the interesting stories similar to what you've been uh, saying. And you mentioned in there things about like the difference between you being a, a parent and being an educator. And I think, I don't, I don't mm. think I asked you this before, but something that uh, um, is always on my mind is I think about like, you know, what do I wish I'd known about parenting going in, right? Like you, you, you and I were, we're kind of youngish parents, right? Our, our kids are just a few years in, but do you ever think about that? Or do you have an answer to that of like, is there something, if you could go in like time travel to your past self, three, four, five years ago and deliver some information about <laughs> parenting, does anything come to mind about something you wish you knew going in? I think like most parents, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty, and you think about what you could have done better and so on. But I think the main thing I would have told myself is it's going to be hard. You're still going to be okay. And I think that's the one part that often a lot of parents sometimes get overwhelmed during the hard moment. It's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But the fact is, the truth is, yeah, parenting at times is hard. That's the brutal truth of it. It's hard, but it's worth it. And so I think, how to say it, keeping the goal in mind helps you pull through those hard moments. When child with child having that tantrum, think of yourself, my child learning how to regulate their emotions, this is not how they're always going to be. I can help guide them out of it. That makes it more, I don't want to say bearable, but it, you can pull through easier knowing there is not a finish line per se, but a better future. There's a better tomorrow where this tantrum stage is not going to be around as long as you deal with it now. Ignoring it does not make it go away. That's the thing. So even if it's hard, don't ignore it. Put it in the work and you'll get there. That's the main thing that I really wish I had heard at the start. Thanks to my educator background, I was better prepared than most parents. But by no stretch would I say I was fully prepared. That's another thing. I've spoken to a lot of educators that don't have children. And I'll sometimes chuckle under my breath when they say to themselves, oh, I'm never going to do what that parent's doing. Or I'm never going to allow that. And I chuckle to myself because I think, oh, you haven't been there yet. And so, yeah, I would just say keep in mind it's going to be hard, but worth it. It'll be hard, but it's worth it. And what gets you by is telling yourself that it won't always be like this. It will improve. You'll mm. you'll have other challenges, right? The, this challenge will be solved, but you'll have other things to worry about then. So so don't don't worry. You'll have plenty of other conflict. And then there's that concept of having a goal, having that milestone, knowing that it's not the end, but that it's just it just takes this this finite focused effort in order to get there. And, you know, Daniel, for some reason, the visual that always comes to me with the, that sort of goal and milestone setting is like when, I, when I'm running and I look ahead at like a tree or a stop sign and I tell myself like, I'm not just running forever. I'm just, I need to get to that tree or that stop sign. And then when I get there, I might even run like a little bit further and then slow down to a walk and take a little bit of a rest and then get back to running. And so that way I can, it's kind of a similar kind of thinking, right? Is I just set a, a short, small, yeah. attainable goal. And then even knowing in yeah. my head that maybe I'll surpass it slightly and feel better about it. And then knowing that if I continue this routine, this habit, then the running will get easier. And next thing you know, saying, oh, I can get to that that tree, no problem, no sweat. And so, and then also when you're yeah. mentioning about the, the feeling like you're unprepared, you hear about when... But parents have like kid number two or three or beyond, then they 
they have they do have new challenges, but they they kind of go into it more prepared. But it seems like with less enthusiasm, yeah. right? Like kid two and three gets gets the less fancy toys or gets the hand me downs, and so it's like the grass is always greener, right? You wish you could start over and do it again better prepared but then you'll you might not be as excited next time and so uh you say that you have this kind of educator background and i'm amazed at uh the 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 teachers the instructors at my school with all of their like energy and and their kind of like recurring focus and it's easy to say like okay well you have to take your job seriously because these are these are kids and they're so precious and if you don't do your job well enough, then uh, all these bad things will happen. But do you ever find yourself trying to get that that re-energized? Or do you have any advice on how we can kind of tap into that sort of educator energy, these people that seem to like always be on the ball, always seem to refocus and kind of can get it almost excited on command? How do you do it? Yeah, look, that's, um, that's very much a reality we face multiple times a day. Not going to lie, there's plenty of moments where, you know, you just need a sit down or you need a little break. And I think that's one of the keys, little mental breaks here and there. The thing we educators have is each other. So I'm not every parent, there are single parents out there, but what I would say is seek people so you can discuss your parenting strategies or concerns with, whether it be fellow parents or other relatives support. As adults, we need mental support from other adults. Because dealing with only children all day, every day, you can, if you allow it, you could go a little cuckoo and loopsy. But the key that you're talking about, I think, is that reminding yourself, once again, the children don't have ill intent. Having that in mind all the time really helps when they're doing something you don't like. Reminding yourself they're not doing this to get to me. And of course, we all have that instinct where it can feel like it's targeted at us, but it's not. And I think keep it in mind, the child does not have any ill will towards me. And the other thing to remind myself is the children's purity. So when a child's happy to see you, it's because they're happy to see you. There's no agenda behind it. They're not trying to get something. If they're going, and it's funny, you are right. It's because they're genuinely happy to see you. And keep it in mind there's no ill intent and the child's purity in terms of how they display their emotion definitely helps me get through the day. And seeing a child, you know, play with something and be in sheer wonder, they're not putting an act on for me. They're just really showing who they are, what they're interested in, what they think. See? So you almost have to remind yourself on a regular basis. And as you mentioned before with running, um, checkpoints are important. For example, um, in a childcare setting, you know, we'll have, oh, we've got breakfast from 7 a.m. until 7.30. Meaning this next half hour, let's focus on breakfast. You could easily get overwhelmed thinking about the whole day. But for now, focus on breakfast. And then after that, oh, we need to go to the next room and use the toys in there. And that's until nine o'clock. Okay, cool. We're going to focus on this until nine o'clock. Once again, not stressing about what's coming. We know what's coming, but focusing on this little checkpoint, this little chunk of time. And then say nine o'clock, oh, morning tea time. Focus on morning tea time. Focus on these routine checkpoints as they come. Because as a parent, I know I've been there. It's very easy to think a million things. Oh, here's what I forgot to do earlier. Here's what I need to do later. And sometimes that can really play around with what we're doing right now. And the thing is with children, you've got to be present in the moment and focus on the now to get the best out of it. And the rest will come up when it comes. We focus on the now, this current routine checkpoint, get through this one chunk of time before stressing about the next one. And you might even realize you didn't, didn't have to stress about it at all. Wonderful. I find that that powerful of in embracing and enjoying and experiencing the now. And what you're making me think back to is maybe when I was about 20 years old, I was mixing 
uh, some lemonade, like with like you add the powder and you add the water. And I you had to count like three cups. And I remember even back then, I had a problem just counting to three. And I was like a 20 year old person because I found myself just letting all the racing thoughts get in my way and thinking about the past and thinking about the future. And in this uh, kind of becoming a parent, I've re-embraced the fun of structure. And I've kind of just, there's all these things that, that I've forgotten about. Like I remember when I was maybe like six years old and typing up, I had like a an old laptop and I typed up like my schedule for the day. And I said, you know, from some 7 a.m. to 7.30, eat breakfast. And from 7.30 to, to eight, take a shower. And, and I just remember as a kid being so excited about just like, planning not the not everything but just planning like every like 30 minute chunk and what i would do and just little things like if you know what what boy scouts is with like there's like a little uh manual of like you'd like earn these like merit badges and go through these ranks and just kind of the the gamification of all these things that are are present in in school anyway right you have the different times and the different classes and it's easy to dread those things or roll your eyes and say like oh they're they're training us to be nine to five employees but there is something to be said for structure and so have you experienced anything similar to this like do you, do you used to be disorganized or were you always good at time management or like what is your relationship with structure yeah my relationship with structure is prior to being an educator i didn't really have so before I was an educator, you know, in my teen years, nearing 20, you know, you know, you're doing your own thing. You're, you're winging, as you would say. And once children come into the mix, you cannot wing it anymore. So what I've learned is structure is security. It, I used to, when I was younger, when my parents tried to put structure on me, I used to think wrongfully, think of it as just restricting, and I ignored the benefits of it. And hindsight, once again, I wish, oh, I wish I didn't resist my parents' structure in my life as much as I did. I'm sure we've had plenty of moments where we wish we'd take our parents a bit better than we have. Um, but yeah, my relationship with it is that structure can lead to a feeling of security. And so much for children as well. I'll be caring for a child, and you know, they're two years old. Obviously, they don't know how to read a clock. But, you know, I'm packing up breakfast. Oh, it's 7.30. Then they remembered me saying one, 7.30, breakfast finishing. And I said, yeah, that's right. Oh, so next we're going to the next room. It just because of the routine time of the day, the child felt secure knowing what's next. It's quite often what makes the child anxious is not knowing what's coming. If any, Think about it from a child's perspective. They are literally at the mercy of the whim of the adults in their life. I decide we're staying home, we're staying home. I decide if we're leaving, we're leaving. I decide if you're staying in the room, you're staying in the room. I decide if you come with me, you come with me. They're very much at the mercy of what we decide to do with them. Now, as parents, you know, how do I say it? Good parents. We want to do the very best we can for them. So that's a good thing when you're a conscious minded parent and you're very intentional with the structure you choose in your child's life. But once again, as a balancing act, you don't want to be overly structured, but no structure definitely, it leaves, it leads to a feeling of insecurity. I've seen several children that prior to care, when they first attend care, they don't quite know how to handle the routine and adjust to it. And that's fair enough. But as time goes by, they do adjust and they even get happy when they predict what's next. I mean, the one child I had, he was maybe five. No, he was four, almost five. And he had never attended care before. But um, I don't know how it is in the US, but here in Australia, there's a mandatory a period they have to attend childcare prior to going to primary schooling or to kindergarten. So the parents were literally just bringing him for that mandatory period he had to attend. And I would say to the parents, you go, oh, so what does a standard day for him look like? Oh, well, when he wakes up, um, 
I'll play them some breakfast. And I said, oh, cool. So what time do they get up? Oh, sometimes really early, sometimes late, really late. Depends what time he gets up. I said, oh, so you, he just wakes up when he wakes up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what do you do after that? Oh, uh, he's got a whole pile of toys in his room, so I just leave him in there for a while. And I said, a pile? And they went, oh, well, he plays with them and he just leaves them in the corner. And then sometimes he plays with them, sometimes he just tosses them about and it drives me nuts. And so that's when I spoke to parents said, what I would suggest to you is pick a wake up time that works for you both. It'll take some adjusting, but stick to it. Stick to it finishing back his time and then get onto that room. Because if the room is a cluttered mess, what often happens with children in? If the space they're in is a complete mess, their play becomes messier play. Meaning if the room is literally unstructured, their play is unstructured. So when we set up the room for children to do their experiences in, they're very intentional with how we set it up. We don't just dump a bunch of toys on the table and hope for the best. We think to ourselves, oh, we should do the painting next to the sink, not next to the bedding. We should do the blocks down low where they can build it, not up high where the children cannot reach what they're doing. The books will be next to the cooking, not next to the musical instrument. And we think along those lines. So I would say to these parents, set up the room in a way, how your best to, that makes it clear to him how he's expected to play in here. But the problem is when it's just a pile and there is no structure, no rule, his play is just going to be literally making a mess because it already fits the situation. That's interesting to think about that we could, could all use being more dynamic and that there is like a, a right level, there's a right size of it. And it's easy to say like, oh, I want to, don't want to be too controlling and too organized, but you need some amount of it. And if there, and for sure, if there's too much, then you need to dial it back, but you need to have some. And you're just, you're making me realize all of these um, just like conversations that me and my wife have where we, we do, we have a wake up time and then on the weekends, sometimes we'll let him sleep in and we'll be like, okay, well, the wake up time is normally at seven, but because it's the weekend, well, we'll let him sleep until seven 30 or eight at the most, but then it's time to wake him up. So we kind of have that blend of the rules and the plan, but then also a little bit of improvisation, but it's done on purpose and it's not just chaos just because all of that's out there. And you're also making me realize of the um, just the the routine and the kind of like explaining the future steps uh, and providing the, the kind of the secure feeling, which I didn't even realize what we were doing as many times I'll say like, OK, we're going to put on our pants, then we'll put on our shoes, then we'll get in the car and then we'll drive to school. And I like tell them these things and I'm not even sure how much he's understanding, but I just kind of go through these motions and tell him this because I'm sure he understands somewhat and I'm sure he at least like understands some of the keywords in there. And it even helps me as well, like getting back to the whole, it's a two-way street of your child is help, but you're also help because it, with us adults and the million things going on and the keys in the pocket and the cell phone, it's easy to miss steps and you don't want to be that parent that forgets to brush your kid's teeth or forgets the backpack so mm -hmm. even the the routine is also helpful for us adults as well and so these are all some yeah. simple reminders but simple is good and some of these things we may have forgotten or are doing and just need to lean into more and so in our conversation here plus the book chapter that you put out is there anything that you feel like uh, has been left out or deserves special attention as far as raising kids or being better parents? Like, does anything come to mind as, as far as kind of the the untapped resource or the the conversation that is not being had? Has any, any sort of subject come to mind there as far as just like what deserves more attention with parenting? Oh, goodness me. Yeah. Turn my best to think about that one. Uncapped about parenting, let me think. Well, I guess with my, I don't want to sound overly critical of some fathers because I am a father, 
Like, I remember speaking to one father that I asked, he was dropping in his child, and he said, and I asked him, what, how was your weekend? Oh, yeah, I did my wife a favor and took the kid uh, to the beach for the day. And then I replied to him, is that really a favor? He went, what? And I said, well, I mean, you're the dad. It's not really a favor when you're doing your half of the parenting. So I think, and I think it was me too, don't get me wrong. It's just probably a bit more common in some dads where you parenting is not a favor to your partner. Right. You're not a babysitter. Yeah, you're, that's the thing. I've often heard a father go, oh, I had to babysit the kids while my wife went to movies with her friends or something. And it's like, how unhappy would you be if your wife referred to, or your partner, referred to looking after the kids as babysitting? That's Not very really good. Thing. You know, a mother, good. if a mother referred to what she was doing as babysitting, I think we'd all get a little offended, but it seems more acceptable when a father refers to what he's doing as babysitting. And like I said, I don't really have it's totally critical of dad because I am one, but I know what, <laughs> what it's like to feel like you've got a lot on your plate. But just remember that what you're doing isn't a favor to anyone. You're not a babysitter. You're not a minder. You're a parent too. And I think fathers in particular need to really keep in mind that can have more of a positive impact than they probably think. I've met so many fathers that the way they speak, it's almost like they're a separate entity to their child's parenting when the fact is they are a pivotal part of it. And so I think fathers should never downplay their importance. Because it's very well known and well read and very overly spoken about how important mothers are. And that's absolutely true. Mothers are so important. I'm never going to even attempt to downplay any of that. I just think fathers eat it. And I think fathers certainly themselves need to acknowledge that and own how important they are. And not just the responsibility side, but there's a positive part to that too. You can really have a great impact on your children's lives if you're aware of it and aware of how important your role is. So, yeah, I would say that's something that's... Um, not quite tapped into as much as I think it should be. I agree. It's not the 1950s anymore, right? It, back, back then, and if, if you were a father back then, you might barely see your kids, but now we're in this more enlightened day and age where as a father, you kind of have to do your part as as it should be. But one thing that I, I've noticed, which there there is still a little bit of a, a little bit of a sexist double standard, but like many things, there's an upside as well. And the upside, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it seems like if if mom is out with the kid and the kid is screaming, it's mom's fault. Just from the when strangers are looking, that's just the way that it, it seems to be. But then if dad yeah. has the kid out there, dad can the dad's doing a wonderful job. I just I feel like I get I get uh, positive looks and positive praise just for like doing the, the smallest amount of effort, taking the kid to the playground. I get all sorts of like looks and smiles and uh, I, you know, I, I, I embrace it. And it's kind of just one of those where we're not quite to the full gender equality yet, uh, but there, there is an upside and it kind of is a little bit of an, of an ego boost. Me just doing my, what I feel is my part as a dad, as it seems like you feel this that same way, but I just feel like I get like over the top, like just like praise and, and, and looks just for doing the, the bare minimum of effort, which is kind of satisfying to the ego. And, and I, I just embrace it. And it's kind of funny to me. Yeah, I would say, look, nothing wrong with embracing and having a bit of the ego beat. As per usual with any little ego beat, then let it get to your head. Then yeah. let yourself think the bare minimum is enough. If the outside world will praise you, like you said, just for showing up, I can speak for myself as, how, how say it, as I'm a separated father, my situation was I had my daughter at the, um, when I was 20. I was quite young when I had her. And I, was, I remember so many different occasions where I'm wa walking her in a pram in the fall, and people would sing my praises, literally for not heading for the hills as soon as I found out I was having a child. Like people are literally singing my praises to the bare minimum of not doing the awful thing and abandoning my child. They were literally praising me for not abandoning my child. 
And don't get me wrong, you wonder, we don't all have our little ego boost, but unfortunately, how pretty sad is that, that I'm getting praised for not doing something awful. Right. So I tend to be extremely critical of any father I hear of that's absent, because to me, it's like, what excuse do you have to deny your child of a parent? What did your child do to you to deserve that? Literally nothing. They took arrived in the world. And so I'm getting praised just for showing up. And don't get me wrong. I love that feeling. Absolutely love it. And like you said, there is that horrible double standard of you see a single mother walk a stroller in the shop, she'll get a bit of judgment. I, a single father in the shop, getting praised. So there is that little double standard there that's not great. But the flip side to that is don't let your praise for doing the bare minimum make you think that's all you got to do as a father. Right. As a father, your role is on par with mine. On par. There's not one more important than the other. And you often hear couples, oh, speak to the boss, referring to mum. And the fact is, you're both equally important. I think as a father, you've got to own that importance. So accept the pain is here and there. Don't get me wrong. Enjoy it. It's great. But don't let it make you forget the equal importance you have in your child's life. Whether together or separated, what have you, you're a parent, you're important, own it. Own your importance and your role. Let the praise add to what you're doing and encourage you. Don't let it limit you. And so this is a, a wonderful and, and sometimes a little bit uncomfortable, but fun conversation of us to, to have about parenting and about raising our kids. And so what's the next step here? If someone says, you know, I'm interested in some of Daniel's insights and what he has to say and how he can possibly help me, what is the next step? What's the website and what can they find there? Yeah, so the website is danieleducatorandparents.com. And what you will find there is I'm putting together a call for parents to do, which is going to be, I'm hoping for, foundation for parents. If the fact is, these days, parents are often the hand of their child, good luck with that. As I think, if they're given a strong foundation in terms of what they expect from development, strategies to handle different stages of development, and so on, it can really empower them. And that's what people can find on Daniel Educator on parent.com. Wonderful. And we can all use that, right? Even if we think we have it all figured out, then we can see if we are doing it correctly and get that step by step. But more realistically, we probably think, well, I'm doing a few things right, but I could be doing better here. And I'm always concerned if I'm dropping the ball as far as uh, m making sure they're happy and making sure that they're getting what they need and making sure that they're prepared for the future, but not so much that they're held back by my attention. And then you can drive yourself crazy if you do it alone. But you mentioned a little bit earlier in our conversation how important it is to have that support system, to have friends, to know other parents, to discuss the, the strategies. And, well, you're doing this. Hmm, that's a good idea. Well, you know, I'm doing that. And a good way to help us get on track is with your website and your course, the sort of foundation for the parents. So we can go now to danieleducatorandparent.com to check out those sorts of resources. And so whenever I wrap up a conversation here, Daniel, I like to look for just like a really quick sound bite, right? Like a really favorite, like quote, lesson, or moral. So does anything come to mind as far as it can either be about life or yourself or about parenting or anything, any topic. But when I ask you for a quote, lesson, or moral that has really helped you in your journey, what comes to mind? Yeah, I think I might have said this quote you last time, but it's still the one I'd hear in love from C.S. Lewis, which is, all of it are not the distraction for more important work, they are the most important work. And I think that's just something we to keep in mind. So often with everything we've got going on in our lives, we can accidentally treat our children like they're a distraction. And don't get me wrong, there's moments in our life where we do have things to do, but just remember, they're not a distraction from what's most important, they are what's most important. 
I love it. They're they're part of you and, and they're part of your life. They're not just some separate little box and everything else is over here. They are the yeah. the reason for these things that you can do. And sometimes you hear this. You hear this about people that are kind of unfocused, unmotivated in life. And then when they have their child or they have their children, then they say, okay, now I'm actually going to make something of myself. Now I'm going to put in the work and I'm going to do that thing that you mentioned before of being an adult and saying, here's my goal and here's what I need to do. And I maybe 100% of the time, I don't feel like doing this. Sometimes I kind of have to just push through and do the work anyway. But having this reason why this, you know, little tiny human that depends on you for their survival and their livelihood, and they depend on you to form properly and make good decisions and all, and all the rest, uh, then now you can have that reason why to, uh, the, to to expand your life and, and you know, help yourself and find fulfillment because it also helps your child and your yeah. family as well. So if you out there in podcast land yeah. say, I need help, I can't do it alone, and I really want to do this parenting thing right, then go right now to danieleducatorandparent.com. Daniel, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Yeah, great to tell you the truth. Thanks for having me.